to the Selected Topics and Statistics Seminar Series. This seminar series happens in April, um, happens in the spring, and is a two-year cycle of two topics. So last year we did multi-level modeling, um, and then this year we're doing advanced regression. So we're really focusing in on um, moderation and mediation. Um, who was in the multi-level modeling? A couple of you. Okay, good. Good. All right, welcome back. Um, I'm Molly McGill. I'm a CAS Research Assistant Professor. I'm the Associate Director of Biostatistics. I'm finishing up a K20, an NIAAA K23 award actually in May, which is right around the corner and kind of scary. Um, my focus of research is mechanisms of change, active ingredients of treatment and mechanisms of change in behavioral treatment. So I do a lot of work um, with clinical trial data, secondary analysis of clinical trial data, whether it be looking at moderators and mediators of treatment effects, or the stuff that I primarily do is um, actually coding the fidelity tapes from the treatment sessions and then testing models around um, how the treatments work. So I do a lot of moderation and mediation. Um, let's see. That's pretty much it about me. Okay. So I'm just going to go over the course overview. The first two sessions are basically going to be review and foundation sessions. So today we're going to talk about regression assumptions, the ordinary least squares criterion, um, different types of variants, unique, shared, explained, unexplained. We'll talk about kind of the distinctions between correlation and regression. Um, in session two, we'll go over more, the, the majority of our time will be spent going over regression diagnostics, so that will be visual plot diagnostics, as well as particular <coughs> tests. Um, do you, you guys can go what, sit. Okay? Yeah, no, <laughs> totally. Go make yourselves comfortable. Um, Sorry. And then we'll talk just a little bit about standard scores, um, interpreting and reporting results, and then variable entry methods. In session three, we'll do <coughs> our session on moderation. Um, we'll talk about different coding techniques and testing interactions, obviously. Uh, we'll go over the lively debate of centering to center or to not to center in moderation analyses. Um, ordinal versus disordinal interactions and testing slip, simple slopes in the, in the case of um, a significant interaction term in the model. Sessions four and five are our mediation sessions. Um, for session four, we'll do conceptualization of mediation models, um, dismantling the sort of total mediation model into total direct and indirect effects. We'll go over a comparison of methods, so the um, talking of just thinking about McKinnon, uh, Dave McKinnon's work, Hayes's, Andrew Hayes's work, um, as well as back to Barron and Kenny, and just thinking about this, the possible differences um, between these different approaches. Um, and then we'll go into normal theory versus bootstrap hypothesis testing and mediation analyses. In session five, we'll just do two extensions, which will be multiple mediator models and then testing conditional indir uh, indirect effects, meaning testing moderated mediation. Session six is going to be a, a wrap up, but primarily what I call a sampler. So that means that you guys can select the topic. Um, so we'll just take a vote, like in session five. Um, so we could talk about do a session on logistic regression. We could do a uh, session on Poisson and negative binomial regression. Um, we could go over GE, which tends to be a popular topic. Um, and we could also do um, power analysis and effect size calculations. So writing up power sections for um, uh, analysis plans that involve regression, mediation, moderation. It's something we could also go over. Um, 
this class is meant to be essentially a review for, you know, those of you who haven't been in a regression class in a while. Um, it's also, I've spent a lot of time trying to really kind of boil down the information and simplify it um, because that's how I learn the information. So trying to think about the mechanics of statistical analyses um, in words <laughs> rather than numbers because I'm a language learner. Um, so that's how I try and teach the course. I do a lot of repetition, kind of saying the same thing in a few different ways. Uh, I think that the way that you guys could get the most out of the course is if you followed along with some data. Um, I'm set up to do lecture for an hour every single week, but it would be a lot more interesting to all of us. I think that it, if you guys had um, data sets ready with mediation and moderation type questions in mind so that you could, you know, start with just the first kind of simple regression, simple and multiple regression models running those diagnostics and moving all the way into specifying a full mediation model or a moderate, moderated mediation model. Um, so, and bringing those, you know, bringing those results to class so that we can talk about, um, so we can interpret the results, but we can also kind of puzzle through some of the weird things that happen because a lot of weird things happen in, in uh, moderation and mediation analyses, particularly when the effects are weak. Um, so kind of unexpected findings, um, things in the model, kind of lack of internal consistency in the model. So you sort of, it says it's significant here, it says it's insignificant here. And um, so being able to talk through those things together. So who thinks that they have some data and some questions that they might want to work on throughout the course? Yeah, show of hands. Can we, oh, oh, an enthusiastic <laughs> hand. Um, can, you t can you tell me what, what you're thinking of doing? Um, the so type of question? Yes, so it's gonna be um, how determine how, for example, drinking, in terms of drinking. Mm -hmm. uh, if I go back to um, the 90 days, if, for example, I should use like a continuous variable or should I decomatize the data in order to even, I, you know, if I have a small sample or a larger sample. Mm -hmm. So I have this kind of question. Okay, so then, so not necessarily moderation or mediation, but really just specifying the best regression model. Right. The sort of the best fit for the type of data that you have. Yes. Okay. And, and I have a serious already identified kind of moderator that I would like to use. Okay, so moderation too. Yes. Okay, good. What else? What other stuff are people working with or topics that they're thinking about working with? Yeah? I'm trying to remember. I had data that has been sitting there for four months, but I learned process this fall. Good. And so I wanted to implement that. It's event level data, two time points. And I believe it has to do, it's a sample size of about 300 college students. Good alcohol, protective strategies, and consequences, event-level consequences. Mm -hmm. So mediators to yeah. outcome, consequences yes. as the outcome. Okay, good, that sounds good. That sounds familiar from, in, from my world. Um, other topics or things that people are thinking about? Okay. Well, I encourage you to think about um, different topics. You'll definitely, I think, enjoy the class more if you um, don't just leave me to talking the whole time. Um, so the examples I'm going to work with, like, like I said, is secondary analysis of clinical trial data. So moderators and mediators of treatment effects. Um, you can interrupt me with questions any time. Um, Ron chimes in periodically with um, kind of helpful alternative explanations. I think, again, it's helpful to hear the same explanation in multiple ways. Um, I think that's it. So these are the recommended texts. The two texts that I use are basically the Aiken and West um, text for uh, moderation 
And then the Hayes process text here, the 2013 Hayes book. So um, once we get past week two, we're going to be working in process. The, process, the Andrew Hayes process macro, which has the capacity to test like 75 different models, which is quite exciting. And, and so you just kind of, if you have like the original PDF, you can like go through and just, you know, point at a model that looks like your model and then there's a nice line of code that then you can adapt for your variables. So it's really an exciting resource. Um, so who's worked with the process macro or the, its predecessors, which would be Indirect um, and uh, ModMed and the, the moderation macros? Show of hands. Can I get a, a tall show of hands? So it's actually not a lot of you. Okay. Well, that's okay. So those of you who have, definitely feel free to chime in with your experiences in it at any time because, like I said, there is some... Um, um, trial and error involved. So uh, the more you experience working with those macros, the better you are able to um, kind of diagnose problems or tinker with them in, in effective ways. What statistical package are you in or referring to? Moving on. So um, I would recommend getting the Hayes book, though. I would recommend any of these books. The McKinnon book is also great. It's just that the Hayes book comes with, you know, a macro and comes with, um, you know, some, some resources and things like that. Is a macro like a program, um, like that you download on, or, or is it within SAS or SPSS? Yeah, it's a, it's a program that you download. It's essentially a, a long line of code that you okay. will call. And then once you've called that macro, you can... Um, run very sophisticated statistical routines with not a lot of syntax, meaning it's like basically two lines, um, rather than kind of like writing out, you know, three or four regression models to run your mediation analyses. Or, you know, a regression model and then the series of, th of um, two regression models for the simple, simple slopes test for moderation. So it really makes your work a lot more efficient and they're also um, I'm like I'm not paid by Andrew Hayes <laughs> but um, they're also have like a lot of great tests embedded in the macro program that we wouldn't necessarily be able to run in you know if we were just running a say you know like a regular path model or something like that um, you know, like tests that compare, that run like a statistical test of the magnitude of uh, two indirect effects, things like that, where you would have to do that by hand if you were doing it, you know, in your own, on your own. Um, it, examples will be both in at SAS and SPSS. So when I provide syntax examples, I'll show you both. And um, if you're interested in learning more about SAS, I also put a primer, a SAS primer handout in um, the course website. Um, if you're unclear about how a, a, an SPSS printout corresponds to a SAS printout, you can, you can certainly bring questions to the seminar. I try and kind of talk about the differences between the two. I think that personally, for mediation, I tend to use, mediation and moderation, I tend to use SPSS, whereas with multi-level modeling, I tend to use SAS. Um, but it's whatever you're comfortable with. So um, who's a, a SAS user? Okay, so a few of you. Okay, good. Um, I'll put PowerPoints and readings up by Thursday on the course website. And if there are any kind of readings, things that you might, that you're looking for, uh, ask me and I, can, I probably have something that I can post, All right? Is the Hayes macro for SAS, SPSS, or both? It's for both. Okay. And I think that's it. I don't think it's for Stata. Um, the other thing about the macro, about the process macro, is that he actually has it set up so that you can download the something utilities, which actually mean, which means that you can turn it into a pull. For, for SPSS, you can turn it into a pull down 
and rather than a syntax line. But I find the syntax line much more efficient to use for when you're because you're you know running and rerunning models so you want to just have a, a, a paper trail of what you're doing. Yeah. Um, in Stata is the KHB macro similar? So K KHB it's a macro for testing indirects and direct effects and mediation. Uh-huh. It probably is similar. Yeah. Um, I think once we dig into it, we can see if it has like Similarly. all of the same um, functions because the process has a lot. Just okay. Um, other questions? Okay. So um, overview of regression. Essentially, the basic purpose of regression, right? Regression analyses examine correlational x-y relationships. The way the regression differs from correlation is that it's a predicted outcome for y versus an observed relationship between x and y, which would be correlation. Um, the way it predicts the outcome for y is by finding the best fitting ordinary least squares regression line. So that means, you know, what that means is essentially the line that minimizes the error in the predictor of the in the prediction of that outcome variable. Um, and we're going to dig into what that means in depth, but really, like, the short of it is that you have your predicted y. The, the, the regression solution <coughs> finds, um, computes a solution that gives you a starting point for the regression line, which is the intercept here, right? And then a set of slope parameters that then move the line in terms of how, you know, vertical or horizontal it is. Um, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, plus the leftover error that isn't explained by the regression equation. Okay. So just an example, this is an example from education. Um, self-concept, the relationship between two types of self-concept and academic achievement. Um, so the variables here are a general, so, general self-concept score and then an academic self-concept score. And the outcome variable is academic achievement. And then grade point average would be an alternative version of that outcome variable. What you see here is just a correlation matrix and a set of descriptive statistics. Um, but the model, you know, what I think what we're used to looking, using regression for is to derive um, a set of slope parameters for the average, um, the average predicted outcome for y, right? But we can also use regression to um, predict individual scores for each person in the sample based on their scores on the, indivi on the independent variables as what, uh, multiplied by the slope parameters. So, Here's the equation. This is just the equation for the, for the observed model versus the parameter model that we just saw, um, the population-based model. The Bs are partial regression coefficients, and they're partial regression coefficients because we have two variables in the model, right? So um, they're partialing out their shared variance between them. Um, when we're looking to predict the academic achievement score for one individual in the sample, um, an example would be um, the individual says, say, has a um, academic self-concept score of six. So you've got the slope parameter for academic self-concept score multiplied by the score of six for that individual, right? So this is the slope parameter for the solution. This is the intercept for the solution, right, for the total sample. And um, plus the general social, general self-concept score uh, multiplied by the score of four for the individual um, equals the predicted academic achievement score for this particular person in the sample. So if you were interested in predicting individual scores based on your regression solution, that's, based, that's essentially how you would do it. And the theory, around this particular question would be just that the, the academic self-concept score is going to have a, a stronger um, predictive relationship to academic, to academic achievement than just a general self-concept measure.
Um, advantages of regression are that it's a very flexible approach, right? So it's flexible in the sense that it's allowing us to work with greater um, complexity in terms of the questions that we're asking. And we're, since we're in the behavioral sciences, we're dealing with complex questions. Um, one example of a way that it deals with complexity or allows for complexity is that the relationship form can be simple or complex in terms of when we say simple, we're talking about linear relationships, and we, when we say complex, we're talking about non-linear relationships. I think we're all pretty used to um, working with linear relationships, even if there's a you know nagging thought in the back of our minds that maybe it is potentially non-linear. Um, the difference between the two is that a linear relationship assumes that the that the, um, the effect of x on y is constant across all values of x, right? Whereas a non-linear non relationship, um, you don't ha necessarily have constant change across, all, um, across the full scale of the independent variable, okay? Um, so an example of a curve linear relationship here would be, say, that um, low anxiety You've got performance and anxiety here. Low anxiety would, um, would, will increase performance to a certain extent, and then higher levels of anxiety are going to hinder performance. And then how you're going to test that is you're actually going to test it through essentially still assuming a linear model, but you're going to add a poly polynomial term. So you're going to add an interaction term of that variable with itself, right? Usually we're used to doing this with I'm used to doing this with um, time, you know, uh, quadratic effects for time. But it could be any independent variable that you assumed had a curvilinear relationship to outcome. So in this example, we have a multiple regression model, but it's actually still just one x, right? So the, um, say anxiety anxiety by anxiety, so anxiety squared, right? And a squared, anxiety squared would be for testing a curvilinear relationship versus anxiety cubed uh, would be for um, testing a, an, like an S-curve relationship, which I personally have never done. Um, let's see what else and this would be for U shape too, right? Yes. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be a polynomial, right? Can you test for exponential too? Yes. Yeah, you that's what I mean. Right? Right. Say it again. You can test for pretty much any nonlinear as long as you can put it into an equation. Right? Yes. Yeah. So um, we're actually, and we'll talk more about these, I think, in week two. Um, the nature of causal factors or predictors is also not constrained, so that means you've got continuous independent variables, you've got um, uh, categorical independent variables, you've got main effects, you've got interaction effects, you can have correlated predictors or uncorrelated predictors, single variables, which is simple regression, versus groups of variables, which is multiple regressions. So there's a lot of different things you can do, and um, that tends to be you know, what, we, what we need. So also regression informs virtually all advanced statistical techniques. So we can also think about regression as the foundation for other extensions or other methods that we will often need because regression is not enough for the complexity that we're dealing with, right? So an example might be generalized estimating equations. So GEE and multi-level modeling, which are both longitudinal methods, structural equation modeling, um, so assumptions. Regression is a parametric statistical test, and what that means is that um, a parametric t test basically depends on, the, on certain, character, uh, certain assumed characteristics of the population to derive the parameter estimates. So what are the characteristics that it's assuming? The primary characteristics would be um, that outcome scores are continuously measured in the case of linear regression. They're measured without error, which is not true, generally, and that they're normally distributed within the population. 
Um, a non-parametric test, in contrast, depends little on measurement and population-based assumptions, right? Um, this is also, they're also referred to distri as distribution-free tests. Um, but why wouldn't we use non-parametric tests then if they have, you know, kind of fewer rules? Well, because parametric tests are far more ro robust as to value violations in these assumptions, and parametric tests tend to have more power and more versatility than, than non-parametric tests. Um, in terms of extensions to regression assumptions, um, there we can think about special types of regression models that allow nation of the appropriate distribution be beyond the, the Gaussian normal distribution. So examples would be Poisson regression for count outcomes. Uh, negative binomial regression for over or dispersed or skewed count outcomes, and then like logistic regressions for dichotomous outcomes. Um, who I know that we're all pr pr pretty familiar with logistic regression. Who in here works with say Poisson models as opposed to um, linear continuous models? Yeah. Negative binomial. Negative binomial. Okay. So and then sort of. The, a, the slight difference is the Poisson model assumes that the, um, the mean and the variance are the same, and then a ni negative binomial model is an extension to that that adds an additional parameter to allow for, um, to, to account for the, sort of the over dispersion of values. So this would be the, the example of the negative binomial distribution, right? What kind of uh, outcomes you're working with that are nasty like that? Drinking and driving. Drinking and driving. Like, there's a, always a lot of zeros, and it's always sort of. And then there's a few extreme. There's yeah. some extreme cases. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I work with um, change talk or um, different observed. Um, uh, I work with counts of statements that occur in therapy sessions, and some of the statements are quite rare. Um, so I will tend to be in the Poisson realm of having, you know, having a lot of zeros, um, but not necessarily being too far out in terms of extreme outliers. Uh, certainly my experience is that you, is that more and more with count outcomes that, that reviewers are, um, grant reviewers or manuscript reviewers are asking for these models rather than a linear model. They're saying, you know, you're talking about drinking days, you're talking about Number of drinks per drink, number of drinks per week. That's a count. Therefore, you should, you know, be working within this framework. So it's a good thing to know about. So variance. That's what we deal with, right? This is our life. Is variance. Um, variance is variability around the mean. Um, what this means is that for, say, for a given individual, we would always predict, it within the absence of any other information, we would predict that the individual is at the mean of the DV, right? Um, and this would be, we would make this prediction in order to be t is, as close to accurate as possible. Now, how often our prediction is would depend on the variability in the sample. Right, so if we have high variance relative to the number of units being measured relative to the sample size, our guess would be far off, right? Well, I can't draw anything, but um, we're gonna have a wide distribution of values around the mean. Uh, versus with low variance, we're gonna be very accurate on our individual predictions, right? With low variance, we've got a steep curve and we're gonna have each individual is gonna be very close to the mean of the sample. Right. Um, what we do in regression is we try to add in, we try to add additional information um, so that we in, in to in attempt to become more accurate in our prediction of those individual scores and the variability around and the idea is that we're shrinking the variability around our prediction right the variability around the mean so what we have done by adding these predictors if we are successful is explained a portion of the sample variance right explain a portion of the way in which individual cases in the sample will vary from the sample mean any questions so far so how do we do it um, a linear prediction model must be created that best describes the data so that's what the statistical program is doing for us behind the scenes 
The solution constructs the line that minimizes the errors of the prediction, and this is according to a least squares criterion, right? Ordinary least squares regression. The least square regression line gives the greatest overall accuracy in prediction than any other possible re regression line. So behind the scenes, the model solution is sort of iteratively, you know, uh, iteratively estimating those, those slow parameters to find the best fitting regression line. And when we say that it's minimizing the error in prediction, it's minimizing the difference between the observed point here and the regression line, right? So we're wanting to, if we've got, you know, a bunch of observed points all around the line, we're looking for the best fitting line, which means it's making these, these distances, the error, as small as possible, okay? So the vertical distance between each point in the line is the error in prediction. We've got predicted y and observed y. Observed y minus predicted y equals the error for each point, right? The total error is the sum of y minus y predicted. But we can't just sum y minus y predicted across all across all cases because we're going to have positive and negative values and so they're going to they're going to potentially cancel each other out um, depending on the scores for individuals and so instead we have the squared the squared sum of these deviations right the squared sum of the deviations between observed y mi observed y minus predicted y okay This is just breaking down um, the elements of the regression model. So we have the coefficient of determination, r squared, which is the sum of squares regression divided by the sum of squares total, right? Sum, so the sum of squared deviations is what we're talking about. Or the reciprocal of the sum of squares error divided by the sum of squares total. The sum of squares total is made up of those, the sum of the squared deviations, like I said. The sum of squares regression is the sum of the deviations between individual predicted y and the mean predicted y for the sample. Okay, and the sum of squares error is the is the sum of the deviations of individual observed score for y and individual predicted score for y. Okay? Sound good? Sounds great. So, it's just looking at a picture, because pictures are good. Um, this all looks familiar to us. We have no relationship, positive relationship, perfect relationship. So what are we trying to do? Regression maximizes sources of information to make the best predict possible prediction for individual, value, vari individual values on a variable. Um, why are we doing this? Because prediction is the first, prediction of an outcome is the first step towards control of the outcome, right? And that's ultimately what we're trying to do, is to control outcomes. We're trying to change outcomes. Um, in multiple regression, you use multiple pieces of information, and each may contribute both unique and overlapping um, explanatory power in relation to the outcome variable. And so each predicted y is based on, and I've said this before, right, that each predicted y is based on the starting mean of the sample, the constant, or the intercept, plus a change in the score, the slow parameter, that would be predicted based on x plus the error, right? So the multiple correlation coefficient and the, um, the, co the coefficient of determination so the magnitude of the relationship between the dependent variable and the best linear combination of the variables is the multiple correlation coefficient. When we square that, we get the proportion of variation in y that is accounted for by the best fitting set of independent variables, right? Can you see? <laughs> I will embed a couple of jokes. They won't be that funny. <laughs> um, 
In simple versus multiple regression, thinking about just types of variance, we're talking about types of variance in multiple regression. Um, the total variance, or R squared, like I said, is the amount of variance accounted for in the DV by all the other IVs. This is made up of both shared and unique variance. We're going to look at this in terms of a picture as well. Um, the unique variance is the amount of variance in the DV that is accounted for uniquely by one IV in the regression. The shared variance is the amount of variance accounted for in the DV by the variance that is shared or overlapping among IVs in the regression. So if we look at this in a picture, we've got the dependent variable Y here. We've got the unexplained variance here, right? So this is all the variance, all the sample variability around the, the mean that we have been unable to explain by our model. And then we've got three X's, right? And so with, among these three X's, we have unique variance, which is here, here, and here. And then we also have some shared variance between, say, X1 and X2, okay? Together, right, together here, 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 and here, we have total variance explained. So what is the correlation coefficient? A correlation, co a correlation coefficient is the degree of association between two variables. This is the amount of observed variation in y that overlap, uh, in x that overlaps with variation in y. Right? These variables are essentially given equal status, right? Neither one is considered an IV or a DV. When we do that, that's just an artificial de designation. Because the metric, uh, because the variables are often in different units, we do, to compute a, a correlation coefficient, we do have to standardize the scores. Um, we do this via a z-score, so we're going to divide the scores by the standard deviation for that variable to, standard, to standardize them. And then the extent to which a z-score in one variable deviates from the z-score in another for each subject is the degree of association, right? And so... We can see this is one among many sort of alternative formulae for um, the correlation coefficients, but what you have here is the, the mean of the product of the x, uh, the product of the xy standard scores. Okay? And then extensions to the correlation would be a point by serial correlation, which is one dichotomy and one continuous variable. A phi coefficient, which would be two dichotomies, and then a rank correlation, like a spearman or something like that, um, which would be um, when we're working with ordinal data, right? So we're working with sets of ranks versus um, continuous, continuously measured variables. What is the regression coefficient? Regression is involved in the prediction of a given variable. X is the predictor and Y is the criterion, right? So we actually have a different status assigned to the outcome variable, to the predictor, to the predictor and the criterion variable. Those are the statuses that we're assigning. Um, in most cases here, you do want to preserve the original units, right, of the X variable. Um, so. To do so, you would establish an intercept, and that's going to give you the starting position for the dependent variable in the absence of all, all in the absence of other information, right? So, for example, for years of experience as an independent variable and salary as a dependent variable, you want to know the level of salary you would expect given no experience, right? That's just the same thing as saying given no other predictors in the model. Okay. Um, we talked about the regression co. Uh, the regression equation, the regression coefficient, then describes how much of a change in predicted y you would expect for each unit of increase in x. Okay, and as we talked through, and which we talked through the formulas earlier, really this is just this is just a product, right? Where we're multiplying the slope parameter by the individual score. In terms of multiple regression coefficients. Um, the overlapping area of the circles, right, is, the, is um, the proportion of shared variance. The total area of Y covered by X1 and X2 is the proportion of Y's variance that is accounted for by all predictors in the model, right? In this case, we have two. 
Okay, so we have dependent variable here and then x1 and x2. The unique areas are the semi-partial correlation coefficients. They're called semi-partial correlation coefficients because <coughs> the effect of x1 is part, the effect of x2 will be partialed out of x1 but not out of y, right? So it's semi, it's partialed not out of y but just out of x2, so it's that unique contribution to y. So, just as a summary of multiple regression, multiple regression is used to account for um, the variance in an interval dv based on a linear combination of interval dichotomous dummy or polynomial IVs. In multiple regression analysis, the parameter estimates are adjusted for the presence of other variables. The equation is an optimal weighting of each variable in the prediction of the outcome. And the degree of multi-correlation among the predictors will determine how much the estimates for each variable are affected by the inclusion of other variables. So actually, it's going to be next week that we'll talk about the implications of, of multicollinearity in um, affecting the power of individual parameter estimates and how to test for that and how to test for sort of excessive uh, relationships among independent variables within the regression model. So that's all I have. Um, and we have 15 minutes. So I don't know if you guys have questions. And that's a sort of o overview for you to get us all on the same page. Yeah? I have a question for you. So what's the difference between a feed coefficient and a chi-squared? Because they're both using two, right? I mean, both because the chi squared you can do two by two, right? Chi, and then a phi coefficient you said is like two dichotomous variables. So, what are those are are those the same thing? Are they similar? Um, I know that you get the phi coefficient with the chi <coughs> square. Yeah, exactly. Um, the calculation of it, I'm not sure. Like uh, the difference between the calculation of the two. Okay, because I just wrote that down. I said to look up, but I figured. Yeah, yeah, well, I'll go look it up too. Yeah, it's yeah. a vestige of uh, when people used to do statistics with paper and pencil, and uh, when a, an electronic calculator seemed like a technological wonder. Right. Um, a fee coefficient was easier to compute than a chi square. Mm. And it gave an index more like a correlation coefficient than the chi square in the sense of, um, you know, the chi square is really um, dependent on the distribution and the side, the ends in the cell. So mm -hmm. okay. the, the scale is difficult to interpret. Okay. Um, and, you know, the other related question is if you just did a correlation of 0, 1, 0, 1 did a Pearson correlation, you get another term which is essentially the same thing, you'll get the same significance test. Okay, thank you. Other questions or thoughts? Um, you guys have your evaluations, definitely give me feedback if you have feedback because I'm fairly fairly new at teaching these sessions, so I'm very interested in improving my skills or improving the um, content that is covered and making it the most useful. I'm used to teaching, you know, statistics to grad students. You guys aren't grad students, so just let me know. All right, thanks.